Welcome back to Art and Artifact. I'm Pastor Carol Clark. Art and Artifact is one of my class series at Faith Lutheran Church, and it's being posted now in video recordings to encourage you in your study of the word. Each topic is shared in three video sessions on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every week. Since this is Tuesday, this is session two of three for this week. If you've not yet viewed yesterday's session, you'll benefit from watching it before continuing with today's session. Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, I ask that each person watching today would be strengthened in faith. Give us joy in the sure and certain knowledge that Christ conquers all our sin through no work of our own. We acknowledge that we receive faith, salvation, and forgiveness as a gracious gift from you, a gift that we do nothing to deserve. We pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Today we return to our look at some of the deuterocanonical books, focusing first on the book of Judith. You'll remember that the great reformer Martin Luther included the deuterocanonical books in his landmark translation of the Bible into German, saying that this book of Judith should be taken and understood as a religious fiction. Luther calls it a fine, good, holy, useful book, well worth reading by us Christians, unquote. When we ended yesterday, we were looking at this painting which illustrates the most dramatic moment from the book of Judith, vividly depicting the beheading of Holofernes by Judith. This work was created by a woman painter named Artemisia Jantileski. The Judith and Holofernes story is one that Jantileski will return to again and again, perfecting her technique and honing the details. Note how in this version, Judith's strong forearms are locked in parallel attack mode. Holofernes dying counterthrust sends a fist into the maidservant. Dramatically spotlit, the three figures emerge from an inky background. Let me show you a later tweaked version by this same woman painter. Judith now wears a more sumptuous golden gown. A rich red cloth across Holofernes' midsection makes us think of a giant pool of blood. We can see a bit of his legs, and there's the suggestion of kicking feet in the struggle. Now the blood does not just drip down the sheets, but spurts upwards from the jugular, spattering Judith's arms and dress. The sword in this version is longer, more vertical and centered, putting Judith's fist in the middle of the action. The faces of both women show firm determination, a grimace of vengeance. This celebrated painting is wrapped up in the artist's own life. When she was 17, Jean Teleski's budding talent was so exceptional that her artist father saw his own skills were inadequate to guide her further. So he hired a friend and fellow artist to teach her. Jean Teleski became this other man's prey and he raped her. When her father pursued legal recourse, taking the rapist to court, the teenaged Artemisia was subjected to thumbscrews to verify that she was telling the truth. The case became a sensation, and Artemisia's reputation was famously ruined. The rapist was never punished. Here's a closer look at the painting. Two women are holding this man down on a bed. One presses her fist against his head so that he can't raise it from the mattress, while her companion pins his torso in place. The women are well built with powerful arms, but even so it takes their combined strength to keep their victim immobilized as one of them cuts through his throat with a gleaming sword. Blood spurts from deep red geysers as she saws. She won't stop until his head is fully severed, 
her victim's eyes are wide open. He knows exactly what is happening to him. The dying man is Holofernes, an enemy of the Israelites, and the young woman beheading him is Judith, his divinely appointed assassin. Yet at the same time, he's also an Italian painter who was a rapist, and the woman with the sword is Artemisia Gentileschi, who painted this. It is effectively a self-portrait. It is a dream of revenge. Of course, after this scene in the story, Judith and her maidservant will still need to get away with the head. Their exit is also a popular subject, and Artemisia Gentileschi paints a version of that too. In the dark of the night, with only a single candle lighting the scene, Judith still clutches the sword. The maidservant kneels with the gory head, slipping it into a bloody bag. They pause as if they hear a noise and fear being caught in the act. Many artists over the centuries have painted similar scenes from the book of Judith, and the great museums of the world are full of them. Many people, when they see an historic painting of a woman pictured with a man's severed head, think they're looking at the story of John the Baptist's beheading. You remember the story of John the Baptist's beheading from the Gospels, right? Herod Antipas, a son of Herod the Great, has married his brother's wife. John the Baptist has loudly denounced this. When Herod Antipas' birthday rolls around, the daughter of this unlawful wife dances as part of the festivities. Herod Antipas and his guests are all blown away by the awesome and no doubt sexually suggestive dancing, and the girl is allowed one free wish. Her mother tells her to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. John's already sitting in Herod's prison, and an executioner is dispatched to do the job. Then his head is presented, as requested, on a platter. As we learned last week, in the biblical accounts of this famous scene, the dancing daughter is unnamed. But the first century Jewish historian Josephus tells us she was named Salome. The great museums of the world have many paintings of Judith and plenty of Salome too. So how do you tell the difference? If you see a painting of a woman with a severed head, how do you know if it's Judith or Salome? Well, here we have an image of the dressed up Judith holding the sword with which she beheads Holofernes. So who is this, Judith or Salome? Well, the head's on a platter. That's the big clue that this is Salome, since the request was for John the Baptist's head to be presented on a platter. The older woman on the left is Salome's mother, who eggs her on to make this request. Salome does not do the beheading herself, and so there is no sword. Next, we go on to the deuterocanonical book called Susanna, another story of a virtuous Jewish woman. Susanna was a young married woman with children, renowned for both her great beauty and her faithfulness to God. Her husband was a big shot in the community, and many Jews came to the house on business. Two older men, total sleazebags, have been appointed judges, and they're among the visitors at the house. Seeing the gorgeous Susanna fills them with lust, and they conspire to get their hands on her, literally. One day, while she's alone taking a bath, they swoop down on her demanding sex. They leverage their demand with a threat. If she does not perform as they wish, these two high-ranking men in the community will testify that they have caught her in adultery with another man. This is a big threat because the punishment for adultery will be death. The testimony of these two powerful older men will outweigh anything she could say. At the end of the story, we learn they've been using this ploy on 
other young women in the community as well. However, Susanna won't do as they ask. She says she'd rather deal with the consequences of their lies and die rather than to sin in the sight of the Lord. They immediately follow up on their threat, charging her with adultery. Everyone believes them because they're men, they're old, and they're powerful. Susanna doesn't even get to testify and is condemned to death. So what do you think happens? Before I tell you, I want you to imagine what an artist like Artemisia Jantileski could do with this story. It's certainly one she could identify with. Let's take a look. Can't you just feel their hot breath on the back of Susanna's neck? It's gut-wrenching. Artemisia so knows this feeling. All right, back to our story. Although Susanna is not offered the opportunity to speak on her own behalf, she offers up a loud prayer to God, crying out her innocence. God answers, the Holy Spirit stirring the faith of an honorable young man named Daniel. Taking control of this miscarriage of justice, Daniel separates the two accusers, questioning them separately on details of their story. Of course, the details don't match and everyone sees through the evil plot. The creepy old geezers get what they deserve. They are put to death, not Susanna. Martin Luther called this story beautiful religious fiction. It extols virtue and a trust in God to work through the most awful of circumstances. So let's turn now to another deuterocanonical book called Tobit. Tobit is a rambling morality tale, which Luther characterizes as a delightful, devout comedy, rife with improbable storylines, a murderous demon, an angel in disguise, and death in the bedroom. It has a happy ending. Pictured here is the key part of the storyline, the favorite part for artists too. The storyline is meant to make you smile. The title character, Tobit, has a son named Tobias, who is getting married to Sarah. The angel Raphael advises a prayer before hopping into bed on their wedding night. So in this painting, you see them on their knees in prayer. They have good reason to pray. Sarah's been married seven times before. Each time her new husband is killed by a demon on the wedding night before the marriage has been consummated. So now she's about to get in bed with Tobias, who's number eight. They pray with zeal. You can see the angel on the right taking care of the demon so that Tobias does indeed live through the upcoming bed scene. Hallelujah, all goes well. Anytime you see two people asleep in bed, particularly rendered in stained glass in a church, like this example, you can guess their names with certitude, Tobias and Sarah. So that's a peek at the awesome variety of literature found in the deuterocanonical books. The Jews kept and preserved these stories from the intertestamental period. Here's a fact you might find surprising. The books of Tobit and Judith are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'll have more details on that tomorrow. Please join me then.